I'm going to be sharing for, with you uh, excerpts from this show that I recently did and which will be available on uh, my Zoom server until April 1st, 2021. And the, it's a much longer presentation than what I'm going to be showing you. But one of the things that really stood out to me has for some time in researching Egypt before the time of the pharaohs is this theme, which you can already see here, of the invoking woman. And that's, that's what I'm going to concentrate on here is just to pull that forward because it's something that is a central, if not the central motif of late Neolithic Egyptian art. And this is in painting, this is in sculpture, various media, rock art. And so I wanted to just give you a glimpse of this. And here we're seeing an example of it on the painted D-ware that we're gonna be looking at a lot of it. But it comes quite, quite early on and they don't really give me a dating on the al Mistakawi cave in southwestern Egypt. This is well into the Sahara. But the figure of invoking women already appears in the rock art. And especially this curve of the arms above the head is something that we're going to see in a later period, but it's still quite early in the fourth millennium BCE along the Nile Valley. And so this is an interesting piece, though, because they've used the crack in the rock as if they're standing beside the river. And you see the reflections of the invoking women in the water which is kind of interesting. You've got these very archaic handprints that we see in a lot of world cave art. Uh, many of you will have seen the vulture-headed goddesses, as they're often called, figurines that are often brightly painted with red-brown ochre and then clothed, the lower part of the body clothed in a white linen wrap. Bird face, vulture face, the arms curved, not really as much arms as wings, and they've also been compared to the horns of African cattle. There's a lot of these that first, you know, I saw a couple pictures of them. I thought that there were one or two, but no, there seem to be dozens of them. And some of them are painted like this one is not, some are broken, others are not. And you can see how, how unarmed like these are. And some of them even have what could look like fingers, but really look because of their length more like feathers so that there's this wing quality, this bird woman quality to these figurines. But the arms raised above the head in this posture of invocation, or perhaps, perhaps if they are considered to be deities or ancestral women, benediction. And there are many, many of these. One whole grouping of them is in ochre painted pottery from the fourth millennium BCE, especially between about 3800 to 3300 BCE. And the goddess and river boat, the ceremonial river boat that we hear about from really late Greek accounts like Herodotus talking about ceremonial boats going up and down the Nile on the festivals. The central figure is a woman with her arms curving around almost in a heart shape with hands hanging over her Afro coiffed head ceremonial insertion of branches in the stern of the ship and echoing her very closely a ceremonial standard attached to one of the cabins in the riverboat that is very similar in shape to the woman herself. These scenes recur many times over in this painted pottery. Sometimes she's standing she could be standing here on one of the cabins, but it looks like she's floating in the air and often surrounded on the shores by mountain goats or gazelles, sometimes flamingos or other birds, ceremonial fans sometimes. You see the mountains in the distance from the shore showing up. And so there are a lot of these. Here there's no boat. She's just standing there amongst the mountains in, in a natural world. But the ritual component of this, the presence of these fans is something that recurs a lot. And we will see images of women holding these fans so that the identification of them is pretty clear. You also see men presenting throwing sticks and the animals may be also part of a hunting context as they're going in these boats along the river invocation for, for the purposes of hunting perhaps. 
Sometimes in addition to the goddess, we'll see other groups of women, both inside the boat and outside the boat, more than one figure with the invoking gesture on the pottery. Here again with the throwing sticks and she's just kind of floating there in the air over the boat. And this one's a little bit of an outlier because she's not in the boat and you have the animals in the distance and they call it a desert hunt scene. And I wasn't shown the opposite side of this, but I'm assuming that there are hunters with throwing sticks or bows on the other side. So you can get some idea. I'm, I'm just showing you some of these. And in the full presentation, I go into this in more de depth. There's quite a lot of imagery, but just to point out to you, and because this is not something that gets remarked upon very often, maybe in specialized journals, they'll mention it, but not something that is given a sustained amount of attention. And when you're calling, uh, these, these figures here are in alcoves and I show other examples of this in the presentation as if they're in shrines on the boat. And note also that the front and back, you have these flamingos standing there, various kinds of ceremonial standards attached to the cabins. So when I say goddesses here, I mean, it's the sacred women might be a better term because it could be a goddess, it could be a priestess, medicine woman, ancestor, there are a lot of possibilities since there's no written sources, we're going only by the iconography. And here's the interesting thing, they don't only show them in ceramic sculpture or paintings, but also she turns up in the rock art. And so here again, we have the woman with the curved arms raised above her head. She seems to have a feather coming out of the top of her head. She's standing in the boat and the boat is being towed up the Nile. So if you're riding a river boat and you're going north on the Nile, that means downstream, then you can just coast along with the current. But if you wanna go south, which is up the Nile, then they used to have a rope. You'll see this with the Volga boatmen too, towing the boat up river. And here's another drawing that's kind of enhanced that same one we're looking at. So you get a, a better idea. The cabin is once again indicated. So she's quite large. She's bigger than the cabin. She's almost bigger than the boat. And we have these long haired women in, in body wraps hauling the boat up the river. This one, I don't have a photograph of. I'm still searching eventually. Hopefully I'm going to find a photo of this, but this time multiple women and three of them are holding these serpentine staves in their hands. Others are raising their arms ceremonially. There's, the standard is there present, kind of a horned structure. And again, a group of people hauling the boat up the river. That's from Nubia. As these are all pretty much in the Nubian region, or in the case of the petroglyphs, the Eastern desert, going out from the direction of say Luxor and Thebes, to the Red Sea area. Here's another example in, uh, you can see lightly carved breasts on there. And perhaps these lines representing multiple people. Most of them have lines below showing the oars of the rowers. But uh, this looks like, you know, we, we could even look at these possibly as representing a journey, a funerary journey to the realm of the ancestors. And so various wadis, various water courses cut through the rock is where these were engraved. You still see the animals alongside the curved arms. And then in this, this same river valley region in, in uh, Southern Egypt, in Nubia near Kom Ombo, there is this, this wadi called Um Salam where the, you have this motif also, and you do have the river boat with the central figure and the many people in it, but we also have dancers. And the arms aren't naturalistic because they're so curved. It's almost as if they were trying to indicate, you know, maybe a multivalent symbolism of, of the cow horns, but you see various gestures here by these many dancing women. And here's another example from Wadi El Atwani kind of hard to make out from the photo. So they supplied us with this sketch showing women dancing hand in hand. And then this one's a little bit more unusual because you have multiple invokers. Once, once in a while you'll have several, but they aren't placed side by side in this way. So this one's kind of unusual, but a group of dancing invoking women. Here's the one I was talking about. There are several like this that I'm, I go into in greater depth 
in, in the presentation, the full presentation that show the three women hand in hand dancing and this one holding the ceremonial fan. The other has some kind of wand in her hand, possibly a wasp scepter, that's one possibility, scepter of sovereignty and power. And this is quite late. We're getting into the proto-dynastic period here. And in fact, Nechen, which the Greeks called Herakonpolis, the city of the Falcon, is one of the early centers of uh, chiefly and then royal power. This one's different in that the women have their arms straight out, all these three female figures with the hands rich, reaching outwards. But they're still standing over one of these boats that we've been seeing, and there are still ibexes in the background. Here's another view, and this is the third figure with her, the arms, even with the hands tipped up, facing upwards. And these are uh, not original photographs, but actually reconstructions, uh, paintings showing them. One last thing I want to go into, and this is sort of parenthetical, but uh, we, we talk a little bit in the show about the goddess Nate and some pre-dynastic prefigurings of her the cosmic weaver and of her symbolism, particularly with the bow and arrow in the pre-dynastic era. This is in the proto-dynastic period, one of the first dynasties, Queen Meritnet, and she's shown as a ruler wearing both the white crown of the south and the crown of Nate. This is her theophoric name. She's named after the goddess, the red crown, the deshret crown with this, this coiling spiral of bringing into manifestation because Nate is a creator goddess. So she's re regent for her son, who's shown here on the palace symbol, the serech, uh, as the pharaoh, but he dies and she takes over the rulership. So she's the first known female pharaoh and a pretty good case has been made about that. And so uh, this is her Stella. And you may have seen pictures of this before because it has this famous emblem of Nate. The, the thing we have to know about the goddess is that her name comes from the verb netet, which means to weave. So originally she is the cosmic weaver. And the crossed arrows are a symbol of hers, which sometimes appear more to be like ties, like as we see here. The, this central element, which is sometimes called the bilobate element, has been interpreted as a shield, but it's very narrow, especially in comparison to these arrows. And here it looks like a distaff, which fits very well with her element, her, 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 her essence as the cosmic weaver. Here too, it looks a lot like flax or some other fiber being tied on a distaff, the weaver's wand. She's been associated with the click beetle, so they're, they're connected here with this symbol of hers. And then in dynastic times, we see her crowned by the shuttle, which is another element, not of the spinner, but of the weaving itself, this, the shuttle in the loom. So here again, this is really not a shield as, as has so often been proposed. And we could, we could make an argument about whether these are arrows or not. But what's interesting here is this is Queen Nethotep, and her name is actually written here. So this reads Nate. This T is added to it because that's the, the indication of a female entity, that, that the, the T ending being feminine. And this is the Hotep character. So this actually spells out her name, but it also shows her in the presence of the goddess for whom she's named. Nate is pleased. Nate is satisfied. So this is a very early queen. And her tomb had jars that were sealed, again, with this distaff crossed with arrows emblem. In fact, there are two of them. And again, Nate Hotep this spells out her name. So this is an impression seal to close off the jar, the, the, the offerings that were left for her. And so here we get uh, some other images of her from, from various pieces of art in dynastic times wearing the shuttle. So I go all into all of this in more depth, and I'm putting this up on YouTube now. It is February 17th, and you can still subscribe to the, um, the full webcast will be up until April 1st, and I'm going to put the link to it in the comments on YouTube so that you can access that and, you know, open source for more detail. This webcast was actually created for my online course 
which is called Researching Women. And you can subscribe to that course here, or you can just look for Suppress Histories on Teachable.com and subscribe to that. And I'm going to be including a lot more material uh, images from this pre-dynastic period, as well as access to the full webcast. So you might want to go that way. And the, the platform on Teachable, this same address, also has various videos, as you can see here, on women shamans who led revolts against empire, resistance movements, women healers, a lot of different topics. And those are mini courses, but they're all video based. So you're invited to explore that. And also my website, suppresshistories.net. So uh, that's just a taste of what, again, it's going to be available through April 1st, 2021. And eventually I will have the whole show up as a, as a mini course as well. But right now, if you wanna get at it, that's the place to go is to uh, look at the comments on this video and you'll see the link.